Good morning. I'm glad you guys are here with us today. I hope you guys have a nice, relaxing week this week with friends and family. This year will be the first year that Haley and I will be in town the week after Christmas in about 10 years, I think. Her her family, yeah, her family was in Memphis for a long time, and they finally have mostly moved back. So we're going to be in town this year. We're excited about that. But uh, we do hope that, as Scott said, you find some time uh, to just uh, think about this this year, especially in the Christmas season. How can you be taking care of uh, those in your life that uh, are maybe less fortunate than you? How can you be taking care of those in need and uh, just sharing Christ's love with them? That's what we're going to be talking about today. I do want to uh, take note of a couple of our home groups. So Scott and Catherine's home group, they, they made some boxes... Uh, some Christmas boxes for first responders, is that right? They gave those out, and Janice Pig's home group did some Christmas caroling for uh, some some folks in the community. So a couple of our home groups are out serving uh, in the Christmas season, and so we want you guys in your home groups as well to be thinking about what maybe can you do next year to serve uh, your community and to help take care of those in need. So we're glad you guys did that. Thank you. And Scott stole some of my introduction there, so we'll try to adjust here. Yeah, but you know what I noticed? Yeah, but you know what I noticed as I looked through the Christmas story this year? I noticed something I'd never noticed before. Uh, Haley and I have a two-year-old, so we're still pretty new parents. And, you know, as a new parent, you see things differently than you've seen them before. You look at things with different lenses. And I'm looking at this story now as a parent, and I saw some things I didn't notice. And the thing that sort of stuck out to me that's interesting, I don't know if it's a great theological revelation or anything like that, but I just thought it was interesting. I noticed that you have uh, Mary and Joseph who have just traveled a very long distance on a donkey while Mary is at full-term pregnancy, right? It's a very long and stressful trip, surely. They couldn't find any space at the local, you know, inn, and so they... They, f- they had to lodge in a stable, which was, again, certainly uncomfortable and stressful and unpleasant, I'm sure. They went through labor and delivery, presumably alone, in this stable, which, again, very uncomfortable experience. Uh, and they're tending to their newborn child out in this stable, and then you have all these strangers show up. You have these shepherds and these magi from the east. And as I look at this from now a a parenting lens, I look at this scenario from the lens of a 21st century parent, and I thought, there is no way Haley and I would have let strangers come hang out with us at that time. I mean, that's what I was thinking. Am I right? In today's culture, we view those first hours, those first days after giving birth in the hospital as very sacred, don't we? We don't let outsiders in right? That's a, not only in the hospital and the, the rules and the safety and all that, that's a big no-no, but also just in our personal preferences, we want those first hours, those first days with only with our closest friends and relatives, don't we? I was thinking there was, there is absolutely no, we would have kicked those magi out of the room if they tried to, I mean, we would have, right? And so I noticed that that's, that's kind of interesting. The very first thing that Jesus did and that Mary and Joseph did was invite these strangers into their space, into their life, which is noteworthy, I think, isn't it? And especially since some of them, the Magi, were Gentiles, weren't they? And back then, it was pretty taboo for a Jew to invite a Gentile into your living space. And so they were kind of breaking some some barriers there and some cultural norms, weren't they? And so they were being hospitable to these strangers and to these outsiders. Um, So I just thought that was interesting. And, you know, we shouldn't be surprised by this because this kind of thing really lines up perfectly with the way that Jesus lived his life in general and some of the things that he came to do uh, in his mission. One of the major things he came to do was, you know, he flipped social expectations upside down, didn't he? He spent time with people and hung out with people that the rest of the world, the rest of society told him he shouldn't be spending time with, he shouldn't be hanging out with shouldn't be giving these people your time and your energy. He invited strangers into his life constantly, didn't he? If you read through the Gospels, you see that everywhere he traveled, 
There were hundreds, sometimes thousands of people following him around, begging for his attention, begging for his time, begging for his energy, begging for him to perform miracles, to feed them, to teach them. And he was hospitable, wasn't he? He, generally speaking, did not turn people away. He invited those strangers into his life everywhere he went. The only time we really see him turning people away is when he has to take time to go pray and be with the Father. That's pretty much the only time we really see him turning strangers away. He spent a lot of time with strangers, and again, not only strangers, but, but people that society told him, told him you shouldn't be hanging out with. Sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, people with contagious diseases, people with disabilities. These are the kinds of people he was spending time around. We talked a couple weeks ago about how he even spent time with the children which his disciples thought was a waste of time. But he said, no, it's not a waste of time, right? So Jesus was a generous person and a hospitable person, wasn't he? In other words, he loved people, didn't he? Timothy Keller, who I mentioned to you a couple weeks ago, is inspiring uh, this message and a message from a couple weeks ago. He says this about what the biblical idea of generosity is. He says, radical Deeply, generosity is this, radical, deeply unselfish living in every area of life. And you could certainly say that about Christ, can't you? Radical, deeply unselfish living in every area. That is absolutely true of Jesus. And it should be true of us as well, of his followers. And one of the main areas of life in which we can show generosity and show this is through hospitality something that you probably don't preach on very often, uh, but it's an important part of, again, it was an important part of Jesus' life, and it's an important part of the life of a Christian, or at least it should be. We talked a couple weeks ago again about generosity in general and how you can be a generous giver financially. You can give a lot of money, but not necessarily be what the Bible would consider a generous person, right? You can give with your wallet, but not with your heart, can't you? And there's a lot of ways to be a generous person outside of money. You can give your time and your energy. We talked about how you can give your emotional space to people, which is sometimes maybe the most difficult one, isn't it? Giving your emotional energy and your emotional space but another one of the ways that you can be generous, again, is through hospitality. Inviting people into your physical space, inviting people into your life, providing for them, taking care of them, and, and just showing them love. We're going to read a passage in Luke chapter 14. If you have your Bible or a Bible app on your phone, you can, t you can turn to Luke 14 or click on Luke 14. And here in this chapter, Jesus is at the house. It says he's at the house of a prominent Pharisee. So not just a regular Pharisee, apparently a pretty important Pharisee. So he's at a, he's at a pretty important party with some pretty important people, okay? And in this passage, we're going to start in chapter 14, verse 7. Jesus has a word first for the guests of the party, and then he has a word for the host of the party. Okay, so let's take a look at the section on the guests here. Luke 14, verse 7 says this. When he, Jesus, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come to say, come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. And you might remember this next saying from a different passage we read a couple weeks ago. Jesus says, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. He says the same phrase in uh, the parable uh, in Luke 18 that we read a couple weeks ago about 
the parable of the two men who went to pray at the temple, the Pharisee and the tax collector. He says the same thing in that parable. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so again, this is kind of the upside-down nature of the kingdom of God, right? And this here, this parable that Jesus uses here about a wedding feast, this is a scenario that, from what I understand and what I've heard, would have been pretty familiar to the original audience, to the people that he was talking to. Uh, back then, when you would go to an important party, apparently the host would reserve the most important seats for the most honored guests. And so when you would go to an important party like this, you would have to sort of play a guessing game of how important am I? Of the 50 people on this guest list, where do I rank? Am I number four? Am I number 44? Where should I sit, right? And so if you sat in, if you got there and you sat in an important seat, an honored seat, you are sort of taking a gamble because if it turns out you are not one of the more honored guests, the host would say, sorry, buddy, I need you to move down there to the end of the table. And that would be pretty embarrassing, right? To be moved in front of everyone like that. And so uh, to play it safe, you would sit at a less honored seat. So then if the, if the host comes to you and says, hey, move on up, then you look really good in front of everyone, right? And so apparently uh, the folks who heard this would have been pretty familiar with the scenario, which is why Jesus uses it to make a point, to, uh, uses it as an example about what happens in God's kingdom. Jesus says, in God's kingdom, if you think too much of yourself you will find that in the end you will be humbled by God. But if you humble yourself, then in the end, God will lift you up. God will exalt you. You will be honored. And so we have this idea that all, he says, all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so Jesus says, look at what the world tells you that you should do and basically do the opposite. Humble yourself before others. And so we have this idea of humility versus exaltation, which leads us into the next section where Jesus has a word for the host of the party, okay? And he says this, uh, verse 12, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet... Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And so Jesus says, hey, when you have a party, uh, you shouldn't invite your friends or your family, but instead you should invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and then you will be blessed. So, first of all, no, Jesus is not saying that we should never invite our friends or family over for dinner ever again. Okay, can you imagine that becoming a Christian and having to go have that conversation with your mom? Well, mom, I'm a Christian now, so you can never come over again. I'm sorry. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's exaggerating. Sometimes Jesus does this. He exaggerates uh, to make a point, right? He does this actually in the very next section, in the very next verses. He does the same thing. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Jesus is not literally saying here that if you become a Christian, you have to hate your parents, okay? He's saying that you should have so much love for God in your heart. You should love God so much that your human relationships in comparison look like hate. And so he is exaggerating a little bit to make a point. He does that a lot, okay? And so here Jesus is doing the same thing. He's making a point. And the point he's making in this one is he's saying, which is better? Which is better? To invite people to a party knowing that you will be repaid, that they may also do you a favor, or to invite people to your party who can do nothing for you in return. Simply do something good for them. Which is better? That's the question that Jesus is asking, I think. And so again, we see this idea of humility versus exaltation. Are we inviting folks over 
so that they can do something for us or so that they can honor us in return or exalt us in return? Or are we doing this out of humility, just doing something for someone else? Invite people who can do nothing in return for you. This is how you can humble yourself instead of exalting yourself. And so Jesus is saying we shouldn't be hospitable only when uh, it's comfortable, only when it's our friends and family. We shouldn't be hospitable only when uh, we can expect to get something in return or when we can benefit. We should simply be hospitable to all at all times. And we should go out of our way to be hospitable to those who are in need, to those who are less fortunate, to those who are outcasts, to those who probably haven't been invited over for dinner in a long time. These are the kinds of people that Jesus wants us to be hospitable to. And so if you want to follow Jesus' example, if you want to love people the way Jesus loves people, you have to humble yourself and you have to be willing to do things for people that other people may not be willing to do. And you have to be willing to do things for people without expecting to get anything out of it. Which is an interesting thought, because again, you may think, well, I'm not expecting to get anything out of it when I have my friends and family over. But in some sense, you could say you are just in the fact that you are having your friends over and you enjoy having your friends over, right? If you invite folks over who can't give you Anything in return, that means you're inviting people over who may not even be your friends. You may not even enjoy having them over. And so it's really a humble act, isn't it? Timothy Keller also says this about hospitality. He says, hospitality is welcoming people into your living space, treating strangers as family so that God can turn some of them into friends. I'm going to read that again. He says, hospitality is welcoming people into your living space, treating strangers as family so that God can turn some of them into friends. I just thought that was such a good quote, such a good idea of what hospitality is. Let's break that down real quick, okay? So let's actually start with the phrase, he says, hospitality is treating strangers as family. And he says this because the Greek word uh, for hospitality literally means love for strangers, love of strangers. That's what the Greek word actually means. And so hospitality for friends and family is good, right? But that's really not what true hospitality means in the truest sense of the word. And that's what, again, Jesus is getting at here in this parable as well. True hospitality is different. It's uh, inviting people in that you don't know very well, inviting in the stranger or the outcast or the foreigner Anyone that might maybe pull you out of your comfort zone a little bit. And so this could be many different kinds of people that you typically maybe wouldn't think of when you think the word stranger. But we have a lot of different kinds of strangers in our life, don't we? First of all, it could mean other Christians, couldn't it? It could even be someone here at this church. I know for a fact not all of you know everyone in this church. Not everyone knows everyone's name. It's a small church. We should put a little guilt trip on you. We should be able to know everyone's name in this church, but we don't, do we? We have strangers right here that we sit next to every week in church. There's a lot of people here at New Heights that you don't know. We're going to be taking this idea of hospitality even more seriously at New Heights coming up soon. Again, we're going to be merging our English and Spanish services together, doing bilingual worship every week, and there's going to be 40 or 50 more people in this service every week. And I'm guessing, again, most of you don't know most of their names, do you? And so we're going to have even more strangers in this room every week. And so we're all going to have an opportunity to be hospitable to strangers. And so when we talk about uh, inviting strangers into our life, we're not just talking about, you know, uh, homeless folks or people in need. I mean, it could be someone right here in your church. It could also be the people that you encounter just every day in your daily lives, your co-workers, uh, your next-door neighbors, the cashier that you see every day at QT that you might even know by name. Let's be honest, in today's society, uh, it's really pretty strange to treat these people 
uh, with hospitality, isn't it? It's pretty strange to treat even the people that we see every day the same way we would treat our family. How often, you know, I mean, how often has someone from work asked you over for dinner? For most of us, not very often, right? We keep our work life and our social life separate, don't we? Or how about this? How often has your next door neighbor, anyone on your street, uh, asked you over for dinner? Or how, have, how often have you asked them over for dinner? For most of us, again, it probably really doesn't happen. I know in my parents' neighborhood and in my neighborhood, it, it really doesn't happen. Even our neighbors today, our actual neighbors, we don't even really treat like neighbors anymore most of the time, do we? We've become very secluded and private in our lives, haven't we? <clears throat> so for many of us, our neighbor or our co-worker could even be considered a stranger in a lot of ways. And so we're called to love them even if it's awkward at first, right? It can be awkward kind of breaking down some of those typical social barriers and trying to reach out to maybe your co-workers or your neighbors, but uh, we're called to try to love them as well. It could also be, again, uh, simply helping those in need. There's over 7 billion people in the world, hundreds of millions, even billions of them uh, are less fortunate than us. Many of them are hungry and thirsty. Um, there's a lot we can do to be hospitable to strangers, isn't there? And even emotionally, maybe not even helping folks physically, but how can we even reach out and be hospitable on an emotional level to people who are in need? Some people have all their physical needs taken care of, but they still have needs, don't they? So there's a lot of ways to be hospitable. So treating strangers as family, and he says, welcoming them into your living space is what part of hospitality is. And so this isn't restricted just to your home, which is good. Because some of us maybe are young and we don't even have our own place yet. Uh, or even if we do, maybe it's not a great place necessarily to have people over. You know, Haley and I earlier in our marriage had a couple of one-bedroom apartments. You know, we could have maybe three or four people over and that was about it. After that, it got very uncomfortable. Um, and so, you know, maybe you don't have a great physical space, permanent space that you can invite people into. But it's not restricted just to our homes. And so... You know, if you don't have one of those spaces, I'm not giving you an easy way out here. There's still ways we can be hospitable and invite people into our space. Hospi hospitality, holistically speaking, is really, I think, more about welcoming strangers into our place of R&R, &R, our place of rest and relaxation, whatever that is for you. It's inviting someone else to share in those things with you, whatever helps you feel uh, relaxed, inviting someone else to share in that experience with you. Or wherever you find joy, inviting someone else in to share in that experience with you. And so it certainly could be your actual house, right? But it could be a lot more than that. It could be uh, your favorite restaurant. It could be the coffee shop that you like to go to and, and, and sit and hang out at. It could be if you have a a group of, of friends that you exercise with, maybe inviting someone in to say, hey, go on a walk with us, go on a jog with us. It could be maybe you're in a book club or some other social club, inviting someone in to partake in that with you. It could be home, your home group. Again, I want to remind you that we didn't start home groups uh, so that we could uh, just meet with our best friends every week. We really started home groups as a way to invite people in, invite the stranger in, right? A lot of folks are intimidated by an invitation to church in the front door. And so home groups are an opportunity to maybe bring someone in through the side door, right? Inviting someone in. Could be inviting someone to your, your Christmas party, maybe even to your family functions, which may be a weird thing, but saying, hey, you know what, guys? I've, I've got a friend who's going to stop by this year. There's lots of ways, right? that we can invite people into our space. And maybe trying to take care of them while you're at it, offering to pay for a meal, take them out to a movie, pay for the ticket. There's a lot of different things you can do, guys. Maybe offering, uh, when someone's car is broken down, you can borrow my car for a day or two, or I can give you a ride at the very least, right? Maybe your car is your place of R&R. &R. It's your only quiet time. Even offering that to someone can be a big step for some of us. 
And he says this, hospitality, again, is welcoming people into your living space, treating strangers as family, and then he says this, so that God can turn some of them into friends. I just love that idea, so that God can turn some strangers into friends. I've experienced this a lot as a pastor. You may think, well, you know, this person maybe that the Holy Spirit is nudging me to try to get to know, I don't have anything in common with this person. And it can be very intimidating, right? But I, what I have experienced as a pastor is just that, you know what? God sometimes surprises you with the people that can become your friends. There have been a lot of folks that I've spent time with and to my delight found out that I have a lot more in common with than I thought. And that's people, sometimes it's because of age, Sometimes it's because of gender. Sometimes it's just because they're in a different stage of life. Maybe they have kids and you don't, or vice versa, or they're married and you're not. And you think, what am I, you know, how am I going to establish a relationship with this person? But you'd be surprised. Sometimes God just works in mysterious ways. I remember there was a lady who used to go here uh, to New Heights, and she was a pretty quiet lady, a little older than me. I didn't, I didn't think we had anything in common. And to be honest, I was a little intimidated trying to talk to her for whatever reason. You know how that goes. Sometimes there's people that you just, you're scared to talk to. And come to find out, we had a lot in common. We had a lot of favorite uh, hobbies that we shared in common, and it was just a, just a pleasant surprise, right? And God does that sometimes. Sometimes uh, strangers that we don't think we want to spend time around can actually become our friends. And it can be a really powerful thing when that happens, right? And ultimately, why do we want to make new friends? Why do we want to make new friends as Christians? It's not uh, because we want new friends. Again, that would be expecting something in repayment. I mean, it's not bad to want new friends. Don't hear me when I'm not saying. But the ultimate reason why we want to make new friends is so that we can share the love of Christ with them, right? So we can share the gospel with them. Make new disciples. That's really the ultimate goal, isn't it? One of the least intimidating ways to show someone the love of Christ is to just befriend them and show them hospitality. Have them over for dinner. Take them out for coffee. Just establish a relationship. Give them some consistent consistent love in their life. It's one of the best ways to, to share the gospel. One more Timothy Keller quote for you today. That's going to be all, just the three, okay? Timothy Keller says this. He says, people get loved toward belief. People get loved toward belief. They don't usually get argued toward belief. They don't usually even get preached toward belief. Most folks, in the end, get loved toward belief, and I believe that's true, which is saying a lot because I'm a preacher. But the reality is most people are not going to be converted to Christianity uh, because you hand them a tract or because they heard a sermon or because you won an argument with them on, you know, theology or something. Most people, if they're going to give their life to Christ, it's because they had a strong relationship with a believer. That's how most folks find Christ. And so, in other words, the best way to make new disciples is to love people. That's the best way to do it. So how can you love someone toward belief? How can you share Christ's love with someone so much and so consistently that they, they might be led to believe? Showing them the love of Christ. Being hospitable. Inviting strangers into your space. Let's pray.